Welcome to Navara Live. I'm Moya Lovey McLean, and tonight I'm joined by the incomparable Rivka Brown. Hi, Moya. <laughs> An incomparable introduction from you there. Uh, we're coming up later tonight, hate crime is down, but unfortunately, hate crime against trans people is up, and the Home Office have admitted one possible reason. There's also new data that shows how Britain's housing crisis has gotten even worse, if you can believe. And at the end of the show, we'll be looking at some eyebrow-raising clips of young Tories. Stay tuned for all of that. If September felt a bit warmer to you than usual, you unfortunately are not wrong. But it wasn't just Britain that experienced unusual temperatures. Average global temperatures last month broke all records by a huge margin. The data is from the Copernicus Climate Change Service and it has been described as gobsmacking by experts. The temperatures really are extreme. This September was nearly a full degree warmer than the average September temperature between 1991 and 2020. No September before this year has been more than half a degree warmer than the average. And on this graph, we can see daily surface air temperature across the entire year. The dotted grey line shows where 1.5 degrees above the 1850 to 1900 level is. That is the level that countries agreed to limit temperatures to at the Paris Agreement. But as you can see, most of September was well above that line. Compared to pre-industrial levels, September was 1.8 degrees hotter. And it followed both the hottest July and hottest August ever recorded. Mm, just get it, guessing. That's not good. Reacting to the data, Imperial College climate scientist Frederica Otto told Euro no News this. This is not a fancy weather statistic. It's a death sentence for people and ecosystems. It destroys assets, infrastructure, harvest. Science attribute the record-breaking temperatures to a combination of man-made climate change and the natural El Nino weather event, which releases heat stored in the oceans. And while the global rise in average temperature last month is breathtaking, it's even worse when you dig into the details. In France, September was around 3.5 degrees hotter than the norm. Germany's September was the hottest since national records began. It saw an average temperature four degrees higher than the norm. Belgium also saw a four degree jump last month. And the UK September has also been the joint hottest on record, with the 9th of September the hottest day of the year. Those high temperatures are set to continue into October, with Copernicus predicting that 2023 will be the hottest year in all of human history. But September wasn't just hot. It was also a month that saw unprecedented weather events. In New York, a state of emergency was declared after flash flooding. Eight inches of rain fell in some parts of the city, with large parts of the subway underwater. In late September, Storm Ilias hit Greece, causing extensive flooding in some parts. In Volos, roads and bridges were swept away, with hundreds of people evacuated. And that followed early September's Storm Daniel, the deadliest Mediterranean cyclone ever recorded. Greece, Turkey and Bulgaria were all hit by torrential rains. But the worst effects were felt in Libya, where the downpour caused two dams to break, destroying the city of Derna. 30,000 people were displaced and more than 15,000 have been confirmed dead or missing. Extreme weather events have continued into October. Australia is seeing temperatures three to five degrees higher than the average, with bushfires burning across 17,000 hectares in the southeast this week. All of this news means that it's no surprise that scenes like this occurred in London last night at a performance of Les Miserables. <laughs> That was just stop oil there with four activists from the group locking themselves to the set. 
five people were arrested and the show was cancelled. Just Stop Oil are calling for an end to new fossil fuel exploration, but it's not only Just Stop Oil calling for an end to fossil fuel production. A new report from the UN has urged an end to all fossil fuel exploration by 2030, saying that many countries are still, quote, way off track to meet their 2015 Paris Agreement target. The UN synthesis report on the global stock take will form the basis for talks at November's COP28 in Dubai, which is being hosted by a fossil fuel giant. Calls to phase out fossil fuels were made before COP26 and COP27, but talks on the issues were sidelined at both meetings. Harjeet Singh of Climate Action Network International told The Guardian this. In the face of undeniable evidence linking fossil fuels to the climate crisis, the industry has long evaded accountability under the UN. The era of mere rhetoric is over, and it's time to hold culpable fossil fuel corporations accountable. COP28 must deliver more than words. It should initiate a process to craft a new global fossil fuel treaty, filling the void left by the Paris Agreement. The report also calls for an international climate fund of between two and $400 billion a year to be formed by 2030. This would be used to help poorer countries deal with the inevitable impact of climate change. For more on this, earlier today, I spoke to Laurie Laybourne, an environmental policy campaigner. So climate change just makes everything more volatile. It will make things more extreme. So sometimes it will get really cold. Other times it will get much warmer, like we saw last summer with those uh, extreme temperatures that then led to fires in London and things like that. Um, the, the model that the kind of image that everyone's got to have in their minds is is kind of what it felt like uh, back in uh, winter 2019 into 2020 before COVID really kicked off. We were, as a country, experiencing a situation where change was happening. We could see that the virus was spreading globally uh, and that it was beginning to spread in the UK. It was like being on the relatively flat, like a relatively flat but increasing curve. And then when we hit March, then everything went haywire. We went up uh, what's called an exponential curve. And a similar process is kind of emerging when it comes to the climate crisis. So we're seeing changes, we're seeing some more extremes. But as we get further into this thing, as global temperatures rise further, it will feel a bit more like that kind of dizzying pace of change that will bring, sure, some hotter averages like hot summers, but it opens up much worse extremes like the savage fires that we saw last year and also colder conditions, uh, both of which could play havoc with our farming, for example, and will be very bad for nature and particularly bad for people who are in a exposed position, those who have got pre-existing health conditions and those who don't have the resources to be able to insulate themselves literally and figuratively from these kind of impacts. So this new UN report that's come out, which is meant to underpin COP28, says that fossil fuel exploration needs to end by 2030, which is a full five years before the UK's new net zero climate thresholds uh, even kick in. Uh, But what are the plans that we're looking at to phase out fossil fuels? What will be replacing them? There's been huge uptake in alternative renewable forms of electricity. Uh, In fact, it's one of the most remarkable industrial changes in the world in recent years has been the explosion of renewable energy and how cheap it has become. It's now, in some cases, the cheapest form of electricity in history, which is quite something to be able to say. And there are plans afoot for how we can make those changes happen. The problem is that they're not going fast enough that they don't include things that actually reduce some of our use of energy full stop, whether it's renewables or from fossil fuels. Uh, That would mean installing insulation, for example, in buildings, which will benefit us anyway, because it will lower our bills and make us healthier and warmer and so on. Um, And underlying all this is uh, the prospect of, well, is the existence of power dynamics in the in the global economy and across society. Certain countries and in particular companies benefit hugely from putting fossil fuels into the atmosphere. And really all of the plans we have uh, to transition away from fossil fuels um, aren't really worth talking about unless they have a dimension that talks about the transition away from the absurd and dangerous power imbalances we see in the global economy. And the UN has released this report. It talks a lot of sensible things. It will go to COP. 
and uh, it will go to this UN climate conference that is being run by a um, a state um, fossil fuel company. Uh, and that just really shows the kind of power imbalances that are standing in our way. It's likely in 2024 that we are going to get a Labour government in the UK, a government that has made a lot of noises about honouring existing oil and gas licences granted. And what a coincidence, the con- existing Conservative government have just granted a load of new oil and gas licences. Uh, what do you think it would take for a potential Labour government to roll back on the honouring of these oil and gas licences? What kind of public pressure, what scale are we looking at? I think a ramping up of what we've already seen, the amazing work of campaigners who've consistently made people aware of the problem of allowing these licences, but also the um, economic fallacies of them. You know, These are not going to contribute to our energy security because most of the fossil fuels that are extracted in the UK and UK waters are sold on what is a global market for these fuels. So the arguments that in particular the Tories are making about energy security are not correct. And you could imagine a situation where you get a mix of that being constantly pointed out, more and more pressure from campaigners, then mixed with hopefully the coming to fruition of some of a potential Labour government's plans on expanding massively renewable technologies and uh, reaching net net zero electricity supply. All of those things mixed together with a sprinkling of continued problems globally where gas prices could get higher like we've seen in the past. And you could imagine a situation where that government could say, well, do you know what? We're doing so well on uh, on exploiting the benefits of renewable technology, on hopefully insulating and other things like that. We hear that there's this massive political constituency that wants us to start to move away from these things. And it would then at that point, you could imagine them starting to move away from those things. But it needs not just the economics, of course, as with anything in politics, it needs the political side to make it very clear that there is that political constituency who is um, also agreeing that we need to we need to roll back on these things and point out that that's partly what other countries are doing and what the science uh, and ultimately the the stability of the climate system demands. We saw this really interesting thing happen the other week when Rishi Sunak outlined his uh, rollback of net zero policies, which was that big business, these big car manufacturers in particular, said, hang on a moment, what are you doing? We actually want the switch to electric vehicles because there's money to be made here. In a capitalist world, Is that an argument that we will see more of in advocating for green policy, especially in places, you know, like Gulf states, you see the economies resting on fossil fuel extraction? Is that something that can be said to them to try and switch them from producing fossil fuels and extracting fossil fuels into a green revolution? So let's think about the economics and then the geopolitics. So on the economic side, absolutely. We passed now a point, it was actually many years ago, where a number of big businesses, a number of sectors basically said, you know what? Massive global changes are happening in, uh, in industry and in the way economies are working. And electronic vehicles, electric vehicles and renewable energy and so on are a big bet for us. This is absolutely the investment that we need to be making right now. And you heard that with Rishi Sunak's uh, announcement about rolling back on the year in which we won't allow new petrol and diesel vehicles. You know, you had some of the, you had Ford, you had some of these other huge businesses saying, this is ridiculous. We are going big on electric vehicles and we wanted to bring those investments to your country. And now that's cast a shadow over them. Uh, This on the background context of the Tory party being extremely bad for inward business investment for the UK because of its, uh, you know, instability as a political party. Um, The when we now let's look at the geopolitics, um, various countries have understood this for even longer. China is at the top of that list. China is installing more renewables capacity than most Western countries are installing uh, sort of more electricity capacity in, in a month than some of those countries are installing in years. Uh, it is dominating markets for basically the green economy. It dominates the supply chains, including for critical minerals. Um, it even makes uh, electric vehicles that it sells in the UK under old British brands like MG. So going slow on this as a country means that you seed even more of the benefits of the green economy to other places around the world, of which China is the top of the list. For the countries uh, in the Middle East in particular that are 
dependent on oil and gas. There's a there's an even more delicate geopolitical situation there. They are so bound into um, the extraction and sale of oil and gas, and some of them are making some pretty swift moves to try and move um, away from those things. But they aren't they aren't really their their game. More is to flood international diplomatic fora with you know, uh, blocking tactics and, and um, you know, certain political narratives that try to delay the transition, um, if not just to give them a bit more time to catch up. So there's a lot of the economics is looking good. It has for many, many years. Uh, big businesses, in, in, by and large, on the side of a green economy, the, geopolit- the geopolitics makes that uh, a bit harder. The head of Climate Action Network International has suggested that in order to meet the goals laid out by the UN report, we need a global fossil fuel treaty. Is this possible? And is it something that may actually finally be brought up at COP, which has always avoided this kind of discussion? I hope it's brought up at COP, but the signs have not looked great. Uh, You know, for many years now, countries that have this huge vested interest on um, uh, extracting and selling oil and gas have always blocked certain wording about definitively getting rid or moving away from fossil fuels. I that there is a, a, a idea of a treaty called the I think it's the fossil fuel non proliferation treaty, which is basically making a connection to treaties that aren't going so well right now, but on nuclear weapons. And in some ways, it's a kind of appropriate comparison because ultimately, what um, burning oil and gas is uh, doing by putting emissions in the atmosphere is threatening the breakdown of the quite in some ways robust, but actually quite delicate systems, Earth's life support systems. The Pope, for example, understands this point uh, with a grip of the science that is in advance of many political leaders. And he said over this last week that the the natural world is breaking down or maybe even collapsing in front of us. And that's the ultimate risk here is like a Jenga tower, we punch out too many blocks of the climate system and bits of it end up abruptly snapping. This is what scientists call tipping points. And so to say, oh, well, there needs to be some kind of treaty architecture to deal with what is already for many people an existential risk will become an existential risk on the grandest scale if allowed to continue in the direction it is, I think is quite an appropriate thing to say. It will require more and more political pressure in countries around the world, including ones where it's very difficult to muster that political pressure without getting into some danger yourself to really continue to to push for that kind of change. But I I really hope that that's something that's going to be high up the agenda at COP. Could the UK's equality watchdog have racially discriminated against its own staff? That's just one of the allegations levelled against the Equality and Human Rights Commission, aka the EHRC, by a former, former senior employee who says the body has become a, quote, agent of the Conservative government. Preeti Katharetcha was formerly a senior associate and the race protected characteristic lead at the EHRC until 2021. But now she is suing the equality watchdog, alleging racial discrimination and unfair dismissal. Katharetcha began giving evidence to an employment tribunal on Wednesday. Here's some of what she said. The commission, which was supposed to be independent and impartial on race and other forms of discrimination, was politicised on some areas such as race and, more recently, the trans debate. By politicised, I mean that the board increasingly acted as an agent of the Conservative government and against parties or organisations which the government were opposed to or were in conflict with, rather than impartially and independently and in accordance with its statutory duties. It is being used as a political weapon in a cultural race war. A reminder that the EHRC is a quango. That's an organisation nominally independent from the government, but funded by the government with senior appointments made by, you guessed it, the government. Catherine says the EHRC particularly fell down when it came to addressing institutional racism. Here's some more of her allegations. The EHRC ignored evidence of institutional racism in reports about healthcare, the Metropolitan Police Force, the handling of the COVID-19 pandemic and the Home Office's hostile environment policy. Politics was behind the decision to investigate alleged anti-Semitism allegations in the Labour Party, but not Islamophobia within the Conservative Party. 
Requests for cross-party inquiries were ignored despite evidence of, quote, pervasive racism within the Home Office and Conservative Party. Race training run by Cathretcha was ended prematurely because it mentioned structural racism. Cathretcha was given an informal warning for raising concerns that the EHRC was being used in a government, quote, witch hunt against the think tank, the Runnymede Trust. Quite the list of allegations there. According to Guardian reporting on the tribunal, Cathretcher cited one particularly telling internal EHRC study. The survey found only 22% of the watchdog's employees agreed it promoted workforce diversity and equality, and only 6.6% of staff believed the EHRC's board upheld commission values and behaviour. This is the same EHRC, of course, that produced the report into Labour's anti-Semitism crisis and concluded the party had breached the Equality Act on two occasions. It was that report that led to Jeremy Corbyn's 2020 suspension from the Labour Party and the removal of the Labour whip. Corbyn had said of the report that he, quote, did not accept all its findings. Preeti Kothretcher actually had evidence related to the Labour anti-Semitism report from The Guardian. She, Kathretcher, also claimed that she was asked to sign off the executive summary of the inquiry into anti-Semitism in the Labour Party without being allowed access to the underlying evidence because the EHRC wanted the sign-off from a BAME employee. She refused to do so, describing the request as, quote, upsetting, disrespectful and humiliating. In the defence, the EHRC denies that Kathretcher was discriminated against and that her claim is, quote, dealing with political matters not related to the respondent. In a statement, they said this. It is denied that the claimant has been discriminated against on grounds of her race, harassed or victimised. It is further denied that the claimant has been constructively dismissed as alleged or at all. The claimant resigned in order to take up a role with NHS providers. Rivka, we sit on a particular part of the left who are probably more likely to want to believe these allegations off the back of this. But how do we judge the veracity of these claims? And is it even our role to judge those claims at all? The thing that Priti Kathratja is claiming that the EHRC has become an agent of the Conservative government is, I mean, it's not, it's not, it's not an opinion. It's a fact. The EHRC is an agent of the state. Its commissioners are chosen by the state. Um, And and some of those commissioners have actually quit because of too much meddling from the state. You know, a couple of years ago, David Isaac quit as commissioner because of number 10 interference. And since then, you know, we've had uh, Liz Truss, notably as the Minister for Women and Inequalities before she was Prime Minister, the person who sets the, the the commissioners at the EHRC, stuffing the EHRC with right-wing ideologues, the kind of people that call, uh, you know, BLM statistically uh, naive, the people who say that the Windrush scandal isn't a reason to uh, cancel the hostile environment, people who, uh, you know, make personal uh, claims and defences for transphobes like Maya Forstater. Um, so, you know, we, we've known that the EHRC is a, a weapon of the Conservative government, as a weapon of, of, of all governments, including the government, uh, Tony Blair's government that set it up, who, by the way, appointed as the first commissioner, Trevor Phillips, a man who was subsequently temporarily suspended from the Labour Party for calling Muslims uh, a nation within a nation. Um, you know, from the outset, The way that the EHRC has been constructed has been as an agent of the state. And as a result, it's been incredibly right wing because all the governments that we've had since have been incredibly right wing. So, you know, what Priti Kathretra is saying shouldn't really be that controversial. What's controversial really is that the report that the EHRC produced and which it is best known for, um, the report on anti-Semitism in the Labour Party, was ever given any credence at all. You know, Jeremy Corbyn was suspended for uh, for suggesting that not even really um, the EHRC report was wrong, but more that the uh, press reporting of anti-Semitism under his leadership had been exaggerated. But, you know, if anything, his criticism of the EHRC report didn't go far enough. He should have been saying this entire body is in, is is corrupt and wrong and has for, for years now been losing um, support from within its own staff because of its egregious bigotry towards not just uh, ethnic minorities, particularly uh, Muslims and uh, people of color, but also trans people. You know, trans staff of the EHRC have been quitting in droves. Vice has r- reported amply on this. I encourage people to go check out their reporting. But, you know, the fact that 
we even gave to, you know, we even gave the EHRC report the time of day back when it was first published is incredible to me now. Um, but I think, you know, what's what's interesting about this is that there's been endless stories and there will continue to be endless stories about the EHRC's corruption and bigotry um, until it, you know, falls apart. But it will continue to be weaponized by the government because it remains, you know, some for some reason, the mainstream media, despite being the same ones that are reporting on all of these scandals in the EHRC, continue to cite the EHRC as a credible source when it comes out with reports. I think it's also worth uh, noting here, one of the really interesting things to me uh, in the uh, in the tribunal hearing, which is that um, Kathretcha was prohibited or discouraged from using the term institutional racism. Now, what is the EHRC best known for now? Accusing the Labour Party of institutional racism. And it seems to me really interesting that the one kind of institutional racism that the EHRC, the state-controlled uh, right-wing kind of outfit that it is, will admit is anti-Semitism. And the reason for that is that anti-Semitism is and always has been an incredibly useful tool with which to to batter the left, right? And it's and it's proven incredibly successful in the case of Jeremy Corbyn. It's also a way of dividing minorities from each other because um, one group, Jewish people, are given this particular special treatment where their um, you know discrimination is taken incredibly seriously by the EHRC, whilst discrimination towards Muslim people, you know, in 2016, two different parliamentary committees said that the EHRC should investigate um, Islamophobia. And it didn't. It just completely ignored it. In 2017, Theresa May tried to weaponize um, counterterrorism and suggest that um, counterterrorism was basically a reason why uh, prejudice towards Muslims shouldn't really be taken that seriously by the EHRC. Um, and, and, and the EHRC didn't say anything. So we know that there is a hierarchy of racism within the state. We know that that hierarchy of racism extends to the EHRC. And yet for some incredible reason, the EHRC report remains like the single piece of damning evidence that the Labour Party was institutionally racist. You know, even the EHRC report itself, if you look, if you take a fine tooth comb through it, the, the instances of discrimination that we're talking about, not to like throw us back to, you know, 2021 20, or whatever it was, the instances of discrimination that the EHRC singles out includes Labour dis intervening, Jeremy Corbyn personally intervening, to on behalf of uh, people who'd faced anti-Semitism in the Labour Party to help them have their complaints seen through by a hostile bureaucracy that was attempting to slow down these complaints. So like just at every level, the idea that the AHRC as a body and as the producers of a report on anti-Semitism, which has since become totemic in our political uh, history, is taken seriously, is completely mind boggling to me. I think also the the point about the why the media, which reports on, you know, this, these claims against the HRC, the gaps in the HRC, then also wholesale will quote the HRC as a repu reputable source, um, a reliable source. It it's comes down to, you know, lots of problems that the media is riddled with in the first place, which is a mixture of a lack of resources, a lack of time, and also unconscious bias, some actual conscious bias, but it all adds up together to make a media that doesn't question these quotes these you know reports when it suits them because they don't have the time to or they don't have the will to and so instead they just report it wholesale and then it's you know well now I've got a news story about it and that means that it must be true it's not been fact-checked or dug into at all. At Tory party conference trans people were repeatedly made a target by some of the country's most powerful politicians. Suala Braverman, Steve Barclay and the actual prime minister Rishi Sunak all attacked their existence. Now some people say that this is a distraction technique by a flailing Tory government, to which I say, yes, it very well can be, but that does not mean it's also not a vile, dangerous rhetoric that has real-world consequences. And we see them now because reported hate crimes against trans people have reached a record high. In a surprise move, the Home Office has now said that politicians may be a factor in fueling such violence. The Home Office has published data on hate crimes in England and Wales for the year to March 2023. The report says this. 
Transgender identity hate crimes rose by 11% from 4,262 to 4,732, the highest number since the time series began in the year ending March 2012. Transgender issues have been heavily discussed by politicians, the media, and on social media over the last year, which may have led to an increase in these offences or more awareness in the police identification and recording of these crimes. I don't think it's an either or there. It, these are two things that could come um, both into play. There might be more recording of these crimes. There might also be more of these crimes. Um, and it seems likely we're seeing more hate crimes against trans people than ever before. And the increase in violence against trans people is also the largest in any category. Meanwhile, overall hate crime is down. On Sky News, Kay Burley asked Transport Minister Mark Harper about Sunak's anti-trans comments. A man is a man and a woman is a woman. That's just common sense. Did you cheer with the rest of the hall when he said that? Yes, I did. I think most people think that was a fairly straightforward st statement of the, of the obvious. Uh, interesting, because um, I've been looking, I've taken the opportunity to look at the Equality Act 2010 this morning, which says um, that people who are going through a gender reassignment should not be discriminated against. And you can be at any stage in the transition process. So actually, what he said is uh, against the law. No, not, not at all. I think what you're doing is. there is, is mixing up sex and gender. Um, he was being very clear that you can't change your sex. Of course you can change your gender and there are very clear processes for doing that. And we've always been very clear about treating people with respect and kindness. Um, but, but getting into this sort of debate where we have these ridiculous things where, for example, we just insist on refusing to talk about women, we don't have safe women-only spaces, for example, in refuges, uh, that, is, uh, that is not acceptable, very controversial, and I think you've got to balance the rights of different groups of people and protect the rights of women, hard-fought for okay, rights sorry. over many years, which many women think are under threat. What's the difference between gender and sex, sorry? Well... Sex can't be changed, gender can be. Uh, I think that's very clear in the Equality Act. I was in Parliament, I was the shadow spokesman when that was going through Parliament. I think that's very clear. The Prime Minister set out a very common sense definition yesterday, which I think will have been supported by the overwhelming people in the country, men and women alike. But it's against the law. The Equality Act 2010. No, no, There's, if you're going through gender no, reassignment, it, it, in other words, if you're going from being um, a woman to a man or the other way around, you cannot, you, you uh, are protected by the Equalities Act 2010. The Prime Minister is saying, no, that's not the case. You're either one or the other. No, he was talking about, no, he was talking about sex. You can't change that. You're talking about gender. He was very clear. Uh, all of the legal protections for people remain in place and nothing he said changed that at all. He was being very straightforward. I think most people listening to his speech yesterday will have thought he was spot on and wouldn't see anything wrong with anything he said at all. Simply not true. Um, plenty of people think that Sunak and Harper are wrong on this, including some Tories. During Suella Braverman's speech, she railed against, quote, the poison of gender ideology. That's when this happened. We don't challenge this poison. Things just get worse. There's no such thing as gender Whole ideology. Whole institutions become captured. No. And no, of course, this is, this is as always happens when the left gets the upper hand, those who fail to conform are persecuted. That was the Conservative chair of the London Assembly, Andrew Boff. For that pretty genteel heckle, Boff was hauled out of the conference centre by a private security guard and a Greater Manchester police officer. You can see him there having his conference pass just ripped off. <laughs> Such an aggressive gesture as well. We did contact Greater Manchester Police to ask what was going on there and why one of their officers was involved in this. And they said, well, the officer was just doing what he was told to do by conference organisers. Afterwards, Boff told Times Radio this. When it got to the point of using that stupid uh, phrase, gender ideology, I mean, uh, uh, perhaps, perhaps that's what broke me, because gender ideology doesn't exist. Gender ideology, that phrase, is used by people who say, I don't like, who want to say, I don't like trans people, but realise that they're not allowed to say that because a trans person is an individual. And every time they use these phrases, all this culture wars stuff, they're attacking people. And, and you know... The Conservative Party is better than that. I know it is from the amount of support I've had over the past few hours. He's totally right about half of that, which is they are attacking people. And then he goes, the Conservative Party is better than that. Well, it's not. 
this is the thing. The Conservative Party isn't better than that. The Conservative Party, as it currently exists anyway, is not better than that. As we have heard multiple times over the past 72 hours from Manchester, from the various you know media rounds that these ministers are doing to defend the, the ridiculous crusade that they're on against trans individuals, the Tory party is not better than that. Um, and Andrew Boff, he might think the Conservatives are, but he is clearly a member of a Conservative party bygone, the hard right are up in the front in charge right now, and they are not better than that. Now, Becca Rosenthal is from a charity called Victim Support, and she said this about the incident. We know that transphobic hate crime is seriously underreported, and transgender victims who support us See, who we support tell us that hostility towards the community is getting worse. These figures highlight just how vital it is that specialist independent support is available for those who need it right across the country. These hate crime figures mirror, by the way, the British Social Attitude Survey, which some of you might remember us talking about recently. It showed a 20% drop since 2019 of people who said they weren't prejudiced towards trans people. That's a 20% drop in people who are willing to say, no, I'm not prejudiced against trans people. And there's also been a 30% drop since last year in people who believe that trans individuals should be able to change their sex on their birth certificate. Rivka, why has this trans moral panic cut through to the public so devastatingly efficiently? I think the real reason is, I mean, what we were talking about at the top of the show, which is people that people are experience, experiencing biblical levels of pestilence in Paris, flooding in Greece, in America. People's lives are changing at this kind of incredible rate. And in the UK, maybe we're not at the forefront of it all the time in the way that, you know, Canada or Greece are, but like we can see these massive changes coming and we feel totally out of control. I think, I think ultimately the reason why people cling to these kind of sort of very appealing, straightforward explanations of the world is because the world at the moment feels in like an incredibly confusing place and people can't make sense of it and people don't know who to trust. And then there's someone coming, you know, onto a podium telling them a man's a man and a woman is a woman. And at least they can be sure of that. And, you know, that their, their, their heating bills are going up, their shopping is unaffordable, they're being evicted by their landlord. And there is so much that they cannot control about the world, but at least they can control who goes into the toilet. At least they can control what pronouns they call people. I think it's about a feeling people people want to have of control. I mean, like, obviously, we, we had that partly with Brexit, kind of uh, a, a sort of pre precursor to that. But I think now it's kind of, you know, moral panics thrive in times of instability because they offer very, very sort of clear cards um, and simplistic sort of answers to, to the big questions. And I think the right has always been really, really good at offering those kind of simple clear cut solutions. And the left has often been very, very bad at simplifying its solutions in ways that make that same kind of appeal. And I think also fundamentally, it's just a lot easier to appeal to people's kind of sense of fear than it is to appeal to people's sense of hope, particularly at a time when, I mean, the the world is not a hopeful place, just objectively. Um, so I think there's lots of things. I know this is a subject that you're really interested in, in Moya. So I'm interested also in what you think about why moral panics have such resonance. Uh, Rivka, Rivka, really trailing upcoming Navarra Media projects. Do you know, I'm not going to reveal why I think moral panics have such resonance right now. But for those of you who are particularly interested in exploring this further, I can reveal there may be a Navara media project in the pipeline. And in the short term, we're actually going to be doing a panel. Uh, well, I'm doing a panel. I'm chairing a panel at The World Transformed in Liverpool, which will be live streamed uh, as a Navara live special, which is all about moral panics and how the left should be responding to them. So I'm sure we'll dig into it a bit more there. There's a new report on housing out. And for a lot of us, it confirms what we already know. That's right. England is the worst place in the whole developed world to find housing. Woohoo! The report is released by the Home Builders Federation, which represents developers. And let me just say this. If the developers are coming to us and saying England is absolutely shite for house building, then you know you're in trouble. Their findings are damning. 15% of English homes fail to meet the government's decent homes standard, according to this report. That is the highest proportion of substandard housing in all of Europe. 
In the EU as a whole, 14% of people live in housing in disrepair, but in countries like Sweden, Norway and Poland, the percentage living in such homes is less than half what it is in England. I don't want to make it worse, but <laughs> there's more. We also have the worst rental market in Europe. I'm just going to say it. We have the worst rental market in Europe. Nearly a quarter of private renters in England are overburdened by housing costs, meaning they spend more than 40% of their income on rent. In France, Austria and Germany, that figure is less than 10%. And despite that, rents just keep going up. According to Rightmove, the average new rent in England outside of London is nearly £1,300 per month. That is a rise of 10% between July and September compared to the same period last year. And in London, the average rent is now just over £2,600 a month, can confirm, up more than 12% since this time last year. The problem is supply. The right move figures also show the average number of tenants asking to see a property now stands at 25. Just five months ago, that key was 20. In 2019, it was six. I'd like to know which bit of 2019, though. Um, the Home Builders Federation is calling for an ease on planning restrictions to speed up house building, but they want a bevy of new privately owned homes built, which I'm like, hmm, will that solve the issue? A load of un unaffordable new homes that could be snapped up only by people who already have the liquidity to buy property, aka the wealthy, aka people who might be interested in building their property portfolio, aka existing landlords who are already maintaining substandard housing standards. But neither private nor social housing seems to be a priority for the Tories full stop. Rishi Sunak failed to mention the housing crisis in his speech at all. And Labour has said it will put, quote, social and genuinely affordable housing at the very heart of our plans to jumpstart the house building industry. However, renters say that vague promise is not enough and they're urging Labour to do more, announce more ahead of the party's conference. Eight tenants unions have released a manifesto calling for three million new council houses, tough action against rogue landlords and rent controls. God, I wish. Labour has already ruled the last one out though. A spokesperson for the group told The Guardian this. Promises to ramp up house building will take many years to deliver and people stuck in the private rented sector in the here and now urgently need proper protections from unfair eviction, eye-watering rent rises and dangerous disrepair. Rivka, I know you do a lot on housing. How, in your opinion, maybe in the short and long term, do we make England not the worst country in the developed world to find housing in? Well, it's definitely not by removing red tape. I think this whole story is a total fiction, um, even though it's, you know, it's the, the sort of headline is correct. Yes, Britain is the hardest place to find a home. But the House Builders Federation want you to think that that's because of all the kind of legislation and red tape. I mean, that's complete bollocks. You know, we don't have enough red tape in this country. Look what happened just a couple of weeks ago in Greenwich, where an entire tower block is going to have to be torn down because it's been put up in a completely different style to the one that was proposed in the planning application. We need more red tape, not less. But I think what's key to, to, to say here is that the reason why we haven't built enough homes isn't because there's all sorts of red tape holding developers back. Developers clearly don't give a shit. They'll put up any, any old eyesore uh, on the Greenwich skyline that they want. What's holding uh, us back is a deliberate Tory policy of not building more homes in order to squeeze the supply of housing so that landlords can charge enormous rent hikes, so that there are 25, uh, 30, probably in the coming months, 40 people queuing outside your door as a landlord, i.e. as a Tory MP. You know, huge numbers of, of, of MPs, Tory MPs are landlords and, and Labour MPs, uh, mind you. So I think we have to, to dispel this like utter myth that it's, that it's got anything to do with red tape and regulation. It's a deliberate strategy designed to enrich landlords. So I think the, the the other thing that we need to uh, to, to also say is that we're not going to change this situation unless the homes that we're building are genuinely affordable. Because if we just build more private housing, they're going to we all know exactly what they're going to be because we've all lived next to new developments. Have you ever lived next to a new development that's social housing or genuinely affordable housing or you know even you know any any form of kind of um, even the kind of affordable housing by government standards is usually only a tiny proportion of the developments that are built these days. We all know that when you see hoarding going up near your house, there's going to be a luxury gym, a cinema, 
a, a Pratt, uh, you know, uh, all sorts of kind of like fancy gizmos and gadgets and wealthy people moving into your area, as well as loads of empty flats. You know, we have exactly this situation um, in central London in Tower Hamlets, one of the poorest boroughs, not only in the city, but in the entire country, where in uh, a single year, 2021 to 2022, vacant homes, I'm just looking, increased by 175%. And that's because you've got loads of bankers, uh, loads of uh, foreign investors, loads of people just buying up property as assets, purely as assets, not even having renters living in them. So it's, this has nothing to do. Our housing crisis is not about the amount of homes that we build. It's the amount of homes that we build that people are actually able to buy and live in. And also, the problem's not going to be solved by having more landlords, because more landlords, a small number of landlords with big property portfolios can just drive up prices. We need more people entering homes that they that they own or in the case of social housing that they have long term tenancies in that can't be used to sort of jack up rates more and more and more so yes the headline that we have a massive housing crisis in the UK is correct. But I think this is a bit of a Trojan horse sort of press release from the House Builders Federation here who are using what is, seems like a very common sense story. Yes, we have, uh, we have a problem here to argue for something very, very pernicious, which is fewer regulations, which leads to the kinds of things that we're seeing from Michael Gove saying we need less um, controls on like nitrates and phosphates in our water. You know, fewer controls mean eyesores on the, on the landscape and mean enormous amounts of environmental damage you know like this is this is an incredibly dangerous story hiding behind what appears like a sensible one every time we talk about landlordism uh and you know the current suggestions that are put forward by the likes of michael gove or the house builders federation and these these half assed solutions that really will just in the long term, exacerbate the housing crisis. Because again, like I said before, the liquidity and the ability to buy houses already sits with the people who have wealth, who have assets that they can liquidate, who can, they can have the cash to buy a house. And it's certainly not the people who are most in need of secure housing. Otherwise, they would already be in the housing. And I think about my friend's landlord who owns nine, nine properties, at least has a portfolio, as he calls it, is a professional landlord, and is just constantly hiking their rent up because he feels squeezed. Even though he has nine different properties, substandard living conditions, mice infested, doesn't do anything on them. And yet sent her an email saying, you know, it's a very hard time for landlords at the last rent increase for small rooms, small rooms in substandard living conditions. But he can. And he feels, because he feels squeezed, he is passing those squeezes on and that will just continue to happen. If you have housing as an asset, if housing is positioned as an asset, then it will be treated like an asset and people will squeeze as much value as they can out of it instead of it being treated like a right. I mean, we're banging a very typical Navarra drum here that housing should be a right. But I think you're correct, Rivka. This is obviously the House Builders Federation has an agenda, but we can pull from their stats and make our own argument with it instead and say, well, you know, you've got the stats right, but you completely misidentified the solution here, which I hope is what we're doing for you viewers at home. Um, just briefly, I mentioned that we're doing a World Transformed panel earlier, uh, and I'm going to go over that again for those who missed it. So we've got two World Transformed panels this weekend. The big dog, Aaron Bastani, will be gracing Liverpool along with me. So on Saturday, there'll be a panel with Aaron. On Sunday, there'll be a panel with me. They are both going to be at 7.30 p.m. They will both be streamed live here on our YouTube. And I'm hoping that we'll be able to find a way that you guys can join in for the question and answer sections. They should be pretty interesting. For more details, head to the World Transformed website um, and check out their program. But yeah, you guys can watch for free at home. The Conservative Party conference has produced many odd little sideshows. Pretty Patel and Nigel Farage belting out Can't Take My Eyes Off You. Top Loader doing a special performance just for the Tories. Liz Trust reportedly hitting Canal Street and shaking a tail feather to Kylie. According to TikTok, it was padam padam. But the weirdest bit of all, the weirdest sight of all, has to be the cohort of young Tories who have descended on Manchester. Owen Jones came across a few, starting with this chap, who didn't seem to be too upbeat. What are the Tories' proudest domestic achievements last 13 years that you're proud of, that you've achieved? Not much. I really, yeah. Really? There's nothing I can really say. I mean, Brexit-ish. One thing that really shocked me about that is young Tories are wearing mullets now. 
I don't think that should be allowed. They've assimilated. They're walking among us. The mullet is meant to be our thing. You can't have a mullet. You have to have a stupid bowl cut. Learn the rules. Um, but with that young guy, despite seemingly having a clearish eye when it came to Tory failures, he then threw Owen a real curveball. Who would you like to take over from Rishi Sunak? I don't know. Well, I've got all these things for new Conservatives. None of these are particularly in the running for the leadership. Ian Duncan Smith again? No. <laughs> Check if he's mog? Well, that'd Is be it... fun, but it's not likely to happen. Would you think it'd be fun? Oh, I think it'd be quite fun. Would you vote for him? I think so. Seriously? I think I might. Do you think it, t Tories would win under him? No, but it's not like they're going to win under Ricky Sunak anyway. It's a real shame, because that kid seems, you know, funny. He's charming. He seems pretty switched on. And then he bag, like, backs Jacob Rees-Mogg for the Tory leadership for the fun of it. Like, I'm, I'm not even here to quibble with his politics, because they're his politics and I would patronise him. But this is one of the problems with Westminster politics. We're encouraged to see it like a game from the beginning. I remember my own brushes with student politicians at university. Thankfully, I never got involved with the NUS. But everyone took themselves so bloody seriously. But the politics, the business of politics, wasn't taken seriously at all. It was a load of 18-year-olds trying to their best to live out the Mac, like the prince by Machiavelli, which I I can assure you it was not a dignified endeavour for anyone. And that is how you get the likes of Wes Streeting rising up the ranks until their health secretary. Because they're seeing, you know, the people who see politics as a game are the ones who are allowed in and allowed to play it. And the ones who actually live and breathe politics as a real thing that affects their lives. Not getting anywhere near there. However, the Moglets, as I'm calling them, weren't the only young Tories out and about. BBC News met one young conference attendee embarking on a valiant campaign to reclaim an old insult. I acquired this badge two years ago from the fantastic Deanna Davidson and it was really reclaiming the narrative that of, of Tory scum and the abuse that gets hurled at us and the derogatory, racist, homophobic and misogynistic labels that get chucked our way all because people don't see that we align with what they're what they think we should believe just because we're young or just because we're a woman or just because we're part of the LGBT community or just because you're from a certain ethnic background. And really, it's just reclaiming that term as something that's not abuse that you can hurl at me. I'm, I'm sat there reclaiming it for myself and weaponising that against you. Why a feat to weaponise social justice language to defend your right to be a Tory like it's a protector characteristic, uh, especially given the rhetoric that's coming out of Tory ministers across the conference. Suella Braverman's speech alone validates a lot of the isms that's thrown towards the modern Tory party. I just think it's fascinating to see the new generation of Conservatives because these young people are coming of age, like coming of political age, with a very different Conservative party than the one I grew up with, for example. From the jump, they are on board with the hardline rhetoric and this sleight of hand opposite world tactics where, you know, Rishi Sunak is saying they're making long term decisions when actually they're making short term decisions. And Swella Braverman says, you know, woke people accuse us of being this and that, but we're actually the ones who are standing up for minorities, that kind of stuff. And it all means the opposites. And they're, they're really on board with that. However, that doesn't mean that everyone else is. Here is a sad tale that was shared with The Guardian. The culture wars, it's. It's, it's a real sad situation. Um, I've had a lot of friends that I've had, uh, and they found out I'm conservative one way or another, and they've just said, I don't want to be friends with you anymore. I go, well, what's really changed in the last two minutes that, from when you found out to when you were my friend earlier? And then one girlfriend. Yeah, just dumped me, uh, but... <laughs> Sorry, I don't want to laugh at a youthful person's pain, romantic heartbreak, but that little laugh at the end. <laughs> the thing is, someone is perfectly within their rights to decide that your values don't align based upon your political beliefs. You know, the thing that had changed was he, they found out he was a Tory. And that is a big weight to carry because to being a young Tory now, a committed young Tory, and what that entails subscribing to politically... As I said earlier, it's a lot, as proved by this exchange between a young Tory that Owen Jones asked about Enoch Powell. What do you think, Enoch Powell? Enoch <laughs> Powell's obviously a very divisive figure. Yeah. What do you think of him, though? Personally, what I think of him is a lot of stuff he was saying, although very divisive at the time, has come to pass. What, rivers of blood? Not yet, no. No, but do you think that's But massive where... demographic replacement in some of our biggest cities has occurred. But his prediction was that would cause rivers of blood 
like the, the like the River Tiber, the, the streets of Britain would be rivers of blood would be ahead. That never happened. No, I didn't say that happened. They did I? No. What I said is some of what he predicted came true. So I do think he was right on some things in that sense. Some cities are no longer diverse. They are no longer diverse in the sense that there isn't a mix of cultures where it's now been completely replaced by one culture yeah. over another. Like, like where? A lot of boroughs of London where the white working classes have been moved out in exchange for a lot of people from What other... do you mean they've been moved out? Well, a lot of the council space in central London now in some of those boroughs have been completely demographically changed to a completely alien culture to what it would have been 50 years ago. But what do you mean an alien culture? I mean, in East End London, it used to be very Jewish. And now yes. it's more Muslim, but that's yeah. always been the case. So, I mean, that's so that's a very alien culture to what it was then, isn't it? No, I mean they're British Muslims. Yes, but it's an alien culture. What do you it's mean? A different culture. Alien culture means it. Alien as in unfamiliar. Yeah, but it's not alien to being British. British is being British means you could be Muslim or Jewish or Hindu. I'm not saying it's to being British. I'm saying it's to the culture of the area, to the beliefs and belief structures of the area, to the institutions that once were there being replaced by new institutions now and new beliefs and new ideologies and new cultures and new religions. Well, they're different completely religions, Completely changing course. it. But, yeah, I it's, mean... But a religion is an entire cultural and ideological outlook on the work, world. There's still white working-class people who live there who go to school with people from different backgrounds and they mix with people from different backgrounds. They're not monocultures. You still have white working-class people in Tower Hamlets. I'm talking about whether or not the native people in those areas feel that they are now in their homeland or if their homeland confronts them as something other, something which distracts them from what they believe themselves to be. Well, I, th I think I, millions of people are actually happy with being diverse. I mean, London has huge numbers of mixed relationships where people from different cultures quite literally set, set families up together. I mean, that's a good thing, surely. I'm not saying it's good or bad. It's neither here nor there. Well, you, I, Diversity is not inherently good. It's not inherently bad. That's not my point. Well, I think it's inherently good. But why, just, is, why do you think that? Because I think you get a, an interesting exchange of cultures and worldviews, and that makes for a more interesting and dynamic yeah, But why society. does a mix of cultures and worldviews provide something good, necessarily? Because we learn from each other. Yes, but why? Well, let's say there's, there's some archetypal, brilliant worldview, the best possible worldview, right. right? Would you then say, oh, let's make it more diverse and mix it with other worldviews? No. It's a tough issue. Tough question to answer, really. That kid whose identity is actually now available, unfortunately, is not from London, doesn't know anything about London, but somewhere he's picked up these ideas, which is very obviously, for those who know, he's parroting the recognisable great replacement theory, uh, which says that, you know, white Europeans are being replaced. It's a far right nationalist belief. White Europeans are being replaced by ethnic minorities via mass migration, demographic changes and declining birth rates among white people, which is nonsense, of course. And what I find interesting is earlier today, I was thinking about this building in the East London that he mentions. He doesn't mention the building, but he's talking about East London. He's talking about these areas, which I don't think he goes to. He's not from there. I can confirm he is not from London. And I was thinking about this one building in the East End, which is the Brick Lane Mosque. And the Brick Lane Mosque is you know, the story of the Brickland Mosque is amazing. It started in the 1750s as a Huguenot Protestant church. It became uh, a synagogue with waves of migration when Jewish refugees moved to London in the 1800s. And then once there was a wave of um, Bengali immigration in the 70s, it's now a mosque. And that building maintains different features. It's got so much history in it and it sums up that area. London's rich history of migration. There's a reason the East End as well is such an amazing space for political organising and radical organising in particular. Partly that's because, you know, lots of um, migrants were shoved in there and made to live in really terrible conditions. So organising emerged out of that. But it's also because there is this rich mix of working class communities who work together. What he's saying about, you know, white families, white working class families leaving urban areas, not actually true. Firstly, in a London, the example he uses has actually got whiter since 2010. Uh, according to politics home data, so the suburbs have actually become more ethnic diverse while inner London is whiter. Why? Because ethnic and minority communities are being priced out of London and young families of all ethnicities are leaving the inner city. Research from the Centre for London has this data which shows that decreases of 10% and more of young families who are living in the likes of Tower Hamlets, Southwark, Hackney, and Lambeth. And it's because they can no longer afford to live there thanks to the economic policies of central government, who, for the entire time that young man has been coming of age, has been the Conservatives. 
quickly on the Brick Lane mosque thing that you were talking about, I actually wrote a story about Lutfi Rahman, the Muslim mayor of Tower Hamlets, and his attempt to uh, save a synagogue, the last purpose-built synagogue in the East End. And I, I talk about the mosque as an example of exactly what you're talking about. If, if people go down to Brick Lane, they can see on the side of the mosque, there's actually a, a original 18th century sundial from the Hujano, uh, from when it was a Hujano chapel that says Umbra Summus, which means we are shadows, which has so much meaning when you think about it in the context context of uh, all the minorities that have passed through these shadowy corners of London. Anyway, I'll answer your question. Um, why are the Tories appealing to all these young people? I think partly it is a contrarianism and, and, and also a sort of liberal identity politics, actually, which I think has produced this. And you see it in the young woman that was speaking earlier in the um, clip from the Owen Jones um, video, where she, where she's got this badge saying Tory scum. And we know that liberal identity politics starts with the premise that everyone needs a wounded identity. Everyone needs some sort of victimhood that they can point to in order to kind of uh, prove their el eligibility and kind of... Um, membership of political life. And so I think if you're a, a, a white, you know, a young white person that's grown up in a sort of lower middle class or upper middle class family, you sort of lack that. And so it's quite, you know, the Tories, who are obviously hated for, for very legitimate reasons, are kind of, you know, you might you might argue um, a, a form of oppressed group because uh, because everyone hates them. So young people might adopt being Tory as their oppressed minority category, because amongst young people, they are very much in the minority. So I think actually, paradoxically, it's part of a kind of liberal identity politics that has divorced identity categories from any kind of political project. Um, and so you've got this situation where young people can claim that being Tory um, and being criticized for being Tory is abuse. You know, you, you hear that young woman use the term, it's abusive to, to describe someone as Tory scum completely um, conflating um, the sort of bigotry for which Tories are hated with, um, with, with criticism of a, a legitimate criticism of a political uh, opinion. So I think actually identity politics is to blame. I'd also say that young woman and um, kind of a lot of her peers are quite... Um, sort of savvy uh, media operators in that they're, they're, they're using a classic uh, PR tactic called Davo. You know, you deny the thing, I'm not a racist, and you attack your opponent by reversing victim and uh, vi victim uh, and perpetrator. You say, no, actually, you're the, the bigot for calling me Tory scum. No, actually, you're the racist for saying that Suella Braverman, because she's, uh, um, you know, a minority, should know better than to uh, than to be a Tory. So it's 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 kind of a, a, a kind of political contrarianism and a victim kind of um, the kind of uh, glorification or the kind of necessitation of victim status um, to be part of a kind of political community. But I think at heart. Um, the reason why young people are drawn to conservative uh, policies is exactly the same as, as as the general public being drawn to transphobic rhetoric, which is it, it, it's embedded in what that young man was saying um, to Owen in that clip. He's pointing to a very real problem: gentrification. Gentrification is a problem. White working class people are being driven out um, of urban areas, just as black working class people are. But the working class are, are what's at stake here, not not racial groups. And so I think you know the Tories have presented a very a very appealing narrative, and that you know the reason why you can't get an NHS appointment is because there are too many minorities in the queue. The reason why you can't get uh, a house is because there are too many minorities in the queue. And so it's just giving the same, like relatively to those young people, convincing answer to very difficult questions that have much more complex, you know, reasonings, the financialization of property, the, the convergence of state and, and corporate interests, you know, um, the, the rampant landlordism among our political class, all of these things converge, planning, um, you know, uh, renting regulation and housing law converge to create these problems. But it's very difficult 
perhaps particularly if you're a young person, to, to, to sort of wrap your head around all of the different um, kind of causes for a problem and, 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 and sort of uh, explain them in their full complexity. Instead, it's a lot easier to just kind of latch on to migrants or to, to black people or to, to ethnic minorities as the, as, as the cause for your suffering. And we know that young people are at the sharp end of, of, of a, an enormous amount of um, social pressure, you know, from the student uh, rent strikes that we saw during the pandemic to uh, social media and the way that it's absolutely frying people's brains to, you know, vapes and all this stuff. Like, young people are facing absolutely the the, the sharp end of, of our social crisis. And it's not surprising that they're looking to the most technicolor solutions for comfort. Very true, but I still think they can stick their Davo up there. Well, thank you, Rivka, for joining me tonight. And thank you, everyone who's been watching Thanks. this evening. This show will be back tomorrow. For now, you've been watching Navarra Media. Good night. 